Good evening. Welcome to Herding Cats 105. Tonight we've got Rodney Black, author of The Cats Program, who will be speaking to us about signals. This is a follow-on to last week's presentation where we talked about wiring your layout. Now we talk about signals in our next session. We'll be talking at a, at a low level about overview of cats, and then we'll have a bunch of tutorials loaded for you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rodney. Take it away, Rod. Okay, thank you. Okay, again, welcome. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. From It looks like everybody here is in the States, so it's good evening. Um, I'm going to start off with a slide about how life often imitates art. And uh, you can kind of see uh, what's going on here. And I, 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 after I looked at this a little bit longer, I don't think that the picture really shows what we expect. I think that they've really got some sectional track there and the guy snapped the shot before they put the sectional track in place. I don't think that they really misaligned it like that. So anyway, we'll start with this and there we go. So tonight we're gonna talk about signals and what I want to do is we'll I'll start out first of all with how, talking about how the prototype uses signals. Then we'll look into block signals a little bit, ABS in some detail, APB in some detail, uh, go to interlocking signals, and then uh, how CTC works. Um, so again, disclaimer here is a lot of this stuff is based uh, um, on panel discussions. I've attended at various conventions and there's an excellent paper by Seth, who I see is online and Byron Henderson. And I will, um, there's a reference to this paper in the, uh, the last slide on uh, uh, in, the, in this deck. So, oops, I can keep using the wrong button here. Okay, when we talk about signals, the first thing we have to realize is that every railroad had unique signal systems. You know, just like it seems like every railroad had uh, their unique set of locomotives and equipment and stuff like that. The uh, uh, that carries over to the signal system. Um, so what that means is, if you're doing prototypical prototypical modeling, then research your prototype, get the employee timetables, the aspect charts, things like that, and make sure you get them for the right error. Because uh, even within railroads and sometimes even in districts, uh, the signal aspects in, uh, change quite a bit. If you're freelancing, there's probably an example of uh, what you want to, how you want to signal your layout somewhere. Probably start with, uh, say, the uh, um, the Canadian Railroad Operating Rules, CROR, or um, uh, G Corps or, or NORAC or one of the, the uh, uh, overarching standards groups. Now this clinic is going to address generic concepts. Um, so what that means is if uh, you're really into the um, uh, Bangor and Arun stock and you, and you say, well, the second sub uh, didn't do it this way. They tapped out the uh, indications of Morse code. I'll say, hey, that's great that you're really, uh, you know, into the historical aspects and, and the accuracy, but, uh, you know, I, I really don't care. Um, the thing to do is to look for the the, particularly the indications more than the um, aspects as we get into it. You see there's a lot of commonality in the roads, but if you focus on indications. So contrary to we rail fans, we tend to believe that the railroads put signals out on, on the main line so that we could see when trains are coming. Well, that, that's not really true. Um, the, the, the railroads use signals, it's, it's all about safety. So if you take nothing else away from tonight's talk, it's this slide that signals are about safety. Uh, the idea is, is that they prevent one train from running to something, probably usually another train. The railroads very early on figured out that uh, that's hard on their employees and uh, it also gets to be kind of expensive. Um, they also prevent a train from running off the rails, you know, into something like a, an open drawbridge or, or going through points backwards or something like that. And the way they provide the safety is that they give a train time, actually distance, to stop or adjust its, its speed so it's got time to slow down. And I should really qualify this by saying uh, slow down uh, gracefully because, yeah, trains can go in, into emergency, but that tends to flatten wheel, put flat spots on wheels, and then the cars bounce and, and, and stuff like that. So you really want a little bit, of, uh, you want to be able to do a, a graceful stop. 
They also facilitate movements because the obvious, the, um, uh, the most secure way to have safety is just leave all the trains in the yard. But if you do that, you're not going to make any money and you go bankrupt real fast. Consequently, uh, it's a balanced game here. And, and the, the balance game is to get as much traffic out on the railroad as you can, but yet space the trains far enough apart that, uh, that they're safe. Okay, this is a slide that people usually start, glaze, their eyes start glazing over because, you know, what's an, what's an aspect, what's an indication, and why do I care, stuff like that. So um, let's talk about nomenclature. You got we got to know the, the, the nomenclature because otherwise the rest of this isn't going to make much sense. An, an aspect, that's how the signal appears in the field. Example, it's red. The name, that's the name of the indication. For example, clear or if, if, if you were using uh, speed signaling or some, or I'm sorry, route signaling or something like a normal approach normal if you're using speed signaling. The point is that the, the indications often have different names for different railroads. The indication though is the meaning of the signal. And that, what that does, it tells the crew how they should respond when they see that signal. Example, prepare, proceed prepared to stop at the second signal. I'll talk about route signals and speed signals in, in a little bit more detail later. But this is your um, Flash Gordon magic decoder ring, because this is what tells you tells the engineer how they, they uh, uh, decode what the signals are saying. If you look at this, I got my laser pointer going here. The, the indications are the, are the rows. So I've got, I'm showing five indications. This first column is the aspect. And you'll notice that's the appearance of the signal. So you notice that for the proceed indication that, that the, the ATSF in, in this example had uh, three different aspects that they could use. They had four for approach. Next column then is the rule. The employee uh, time, uh, the employee rule book has all the rules are numbered. So in the, on the ATSF case, then uh, the the proceed as the clear as indication is for rule 950. Here's the name that the ATSF called the, the indications. Then here's the indication itself, what it does. Um, I'll confess here, oh, okay, that, that when I started doing CATS, I did not understand the significance of restricting and stop and proceed. And we'll see that a little bit later. But basically, what we're showing here is a clear that says full speed, approach says I got to slow down. And then we have these three kinds of stops. And I broke them out because a permissive stop uh, says you stop and then you can continue on. And an absolute stop says you stop and you stay there. The uh, analogy is if you're driving your car and you pull up to a, a light, if uh, you're gonna turn red, most states allow you to do a right turn on red. So you pull up, you stop, check for traffic, make your right hand turn. That would be a permissive type stop. If you're going through the intersection, you're making a left hand turn, you pull up, you see a red signal, you sit and you wait until the signal changes to something else, something other than red, or you know, some um, buddy waves you through the intersection. So people will say restrictive, and that's reflection of allowable speed of how uh, through a, uh, a signal. And the opposite of restricted then is permissive. And we have the way it works. Again, we got clear approach, soft stops, hard stops. Um, the slower you are, it goes from slower to faster on this scale and it goes from um, less restrictive to more restrictive. So this could be from um, permissive to, to more permissive. Next thing is the appearance includes also the markers, the feathers for people over at seas. They'll put feathers on signals, the plates and stuff like that. So it's not just the, the light or the swim form orientation that tells you what the, uh, the appearance of the signal is. One other point to make, and, and I couldn't find a better place to put it than here, is uh, some signals will have a flashing light. And a flashing light is usually less restrictive than a solid light of the same color. Uh, the reason for this being is that it, the, the failure, main failure mechanism for a flashing light is that it'll stop flashing. If it stops dark, then that's usually an indication of, of an equipment failure and the signal then is, is said to be uh, 
absolute it's like it's absolute red if it's if it uh, fails in it the, with the light on then you don't want the signal to show a faster speed than when it's uh, when the light is flashing so consideration let's talk about we'll talk I'll talk about where signals are placed what kind of functionality they have Layout requirements for um, giving the, the right indications and where they're appropriate. Let me deal with the, the last one first. What's appropriate to signal? Generally, main lines, branch lines, entries to main lines and branch lines, things like that. Generally, you don't do yards, except you may see pictures like of, uh, of uh, Chicago Union Depot. The approach to that has signals, you know, dwarfs all over the place. And uh, you may see hazards like gates and highway crossings in in, um, in yards. Well, w w what I found is that when I consult with uh, people who are just are not familiar with this stuff and they're trying to design the signaling system, the layout, for, you know, where they want to put signals on their layout, they tend to treat the uh, signals like pixie dust. You know, you just sprinkle it all over the place and magically this the uh, layout will operate to prototypically. Well, I'm more of a minimal, minimalist, and um, I'll, I'll discuss where the decisions I use on where to place signals. And I'm a minimalist because um, the signals are expensive on the prototype, and we're not just talking about the lights and the, and the steel and the mast and stuff like that. But you got power, and you got the um, electronics and the bungalow and and uh, the interconnections and all that kind of stuff. And and here. The prototype of the modeler agrees. Signals are also expensive for the modeler. So, okay, let's talk just for a moment about block signals in general. I grabbed this out of John Armstrong's, uh, one of his legendary articles on all about signals out of, of Trains Magazine. I read it and it takes a little while for the brain to digest what he's saying. The basic way he's saying is that the uh, blocks provide space a space cushion between trains and so then the question always comes up well how long should a block be some people say a block should be long enough to hold a train but the important thing really if we think about safety is that a block should be long enough for a train at track speed to come to a complete stop and again without having to hit the brakes emergency um, or you know lock up the wheels and he also talks about exclusion. And the exclusion is facilitated by a track circuit, uh, what we call a, a detector. And you know we went over some of those uh, um, last week. Now, what do you do if your block is too short? And the railroads ran into this because this train's got uh, longer and, and, and um, uh, bigger, heavier, faster. Um, the, the blocks, they... they the blocks had to be longer. Well, there were two ways of doing things. One would be to rip out the, the um, insulators between blocks and combine them together and stuff like that. So if we look, uh, the, the classic um, single, single signal progression is a three aspect progression, what we're all familiar with, red, yellow, green, one, two, three. What some railroads to do then is they would go to a four aspect progression of a red, a yellow, an advanced approach of some form, you use often a flashing yellow, and then over here would be the, the uh, clear signal. So consequently, you may want to add into your aspect map then your aspect chart an advanced approach of some form. And this, uh, again, this, the uh, advanced uh, approach is often very railroad specific. So let's, let's dive down now into automatic block signals. How does it work? Um, I couldn't find a real good definition of what ABS is, so it's kind of like electronic checking to prevent trains from running into each other. And again, it all depends upon detection. We'll look at a little more detail at this in just a couple minutes. Uh, it's an alternative to Rule 99. Again, the uh, Railroad Rail Book Rule 99 is typically flag protection required against following trains on the same track. So if you've got ABS in place, you, you know, technically you don't need to have a Fred or a caboose or something like that, but I think most railroads do it anyway, just uh, the, that extra level of security. Typically, again, um, sidings are unbonded, undetected, and it augment, augments track occupancy authorization, except for um, some railroads. 
Um, again, I think they'll become clear in a minute. As a follow on to last week's talk, it's appropriate for all operating schemes. So you can do shout and go, mother may, may I, TTTO and so forth. I had a, I helped a friend out with, with uh, his rail, very nice uh, in scale railroad. And he wanted to signal it, but he uh, didn't want to put a dispatcher on it. And I said, well, no problem. You know, then use something like ABS or APB or something. And that would be a case then where uh, I, the, you may, the signals may uh, give you authority to uh, occupy a block um, as well as, as safety. But, okay, let's look at how things work. So here, I've got two sidings connected by single track, and I've got signals between them. I got a train approaching, and a uh, westbound approaching, and he's ready to uh, uh, pass this signal. It's green. The question is, can he pass it? And the answer is, well, maybe. And he, what he needs, it's green, which says it's safe to pass it, but he needs a piece of paper in his hand. In particular, he needs a, a timetable that says he's allowed to, or he needs a train order or a track warrant or something like that. And it's that piece of paper that gives him the authorization, the authority to go past it. Um, conversely, if he pulls up, he's got train order in his hand, and he sees a red signal, can he pass that? answer is no, because it's not safe. Okay, so let's assume it, he had a green signal, he's got the paperwork, he continues on, and, and this is uh, the case that most people are familiar with. Um, after he uh, uh, passes into the first block, okay, the other thing I should say is that this, this first signal is called the head block, and, and it's an absolute signal. Um, as soon as he passes it, it turns red, Okay, he continues on down the line, and as he enters each block, uh, the uh, signal turns red behind him, and when he exits a, a block, then it, the signal goes to yellow and then green. Now, the signals, these automatics in between, um, sometimes intermediates in a CTC system, is they're, they're permissive signals. You can tell because they've got this plate on them. And so, why the difference? Consider for a moment that you're in a train, you're crossing the Mojave Desert in the middle of the night, um, no radio uh, connection because of where you're at, no stations open, and you pull up to a signal and it's red. What do you do? Well, if it's, a, if it's an absolute signal, you stop. And you're going to be sitting there until somebody realizes that you're overdue and they send out a rescue party or something. Um, alternatively, if the signal is a permissive, you stop and you proceed at restricted speed, which is usually less than 15 miles an hour, prepared to stop in half the visible different distance. So that way you get going. And maybe when you get the next signal, um, well, first of all, maybe the signal had just failed. So you get to the next signal and it's green and you can take off again. So basically uh, an ABS uh, signaling system is the safety overlay. And here are the, the succinct points on it. There's no siding detection. Um, you've got, uh, you don't have um, um, signals on the area, on the, the legs here, but rather you've got an absolute signal right here. Um, the signals show condition of track next to, of track to the next signal. It's not authority. If they, uh, the way they work is if you understand relay, something like this would probably work. And the logic behind it is if the neck, if the block the signal is protecting is occupied, then it's going to be red. Else, if the next signal is red, then it's going to be yellow. Else, it's going to be green. So you can see, for example, this signal, it needs to know the block occupancy, and it needs to know the indication of the next signal. And if you're going to do uh, for a model railroad, it looks something like this. You got detectors, you got blocks, you got signals, and you got some boards here. Why I'm illustrating here is a, probably an inexpensive way of doing things. If you're into hardware, you can do something like a field programmable gate array. Um, you could do discrete based on this article out of, uh, of um, Model Rotary Magazine. You could do Arduino. This tends to be pretty expensive. There's no PC, so the signaling system comes up immediately. If you do approach lighting where the signals turn on only when there's a, a train in front of it, then you need a few more wires. Or you could go with the PC. 
And this is more like about what we talked about last week. You got detectors, stationary decoders. The detectors tell this, uh, trigger the stationary decoders, which tell the, the PC what the uh, block occupancy is. The, BC, the PC then tells the stationary decoder what color to make the signals. Okay, so um, uh, you could use Arduinos. Um, you've got lots of commercial products you could use here. And uh, the important thing is this is really flexible because you could go from um, uh, ABS to APB just by changing the software and all the rest of the hardware remains the same. For uh, software, JMRI, you could go to Bruce Chubb's um, um, stuff he's done, and I've referenced that at the very back. And if you understand basic code, you could then um, generate an ABS system from what he's done. Next, let's move from ABS into absolute permissive. And if you were um, observant, you might have noticed that in the previous, in the ABS, I only signaled the, the tracks in, in one direction. And the reason for this is that ABS is not very good when you, you have bi-directional traffic. And for example, what we've got here are two trains approaching each other. Um, one should have authority to pass uh, the green, the other one shouldn't, but let's say somebody messed up, you know, the dispatcher wrote the order wrong, an engineer misread the signal, or he misread his order wrong or something, they both proceed. Eventually, they're gonna get to a point where there's only one block between them. And when that happens, they're gonna probably both be staring at a yellow signal. And the idea again of a block is that permits the train to gracefully slow down um, before the next signal. So you need two blocks really to be safe. And, and what will probably happen here is they'll collide somewhere in the middle. And that's why the, there's that half visual distance um, feature of the uh, restricting, you know, 50 miles an hour or be able to stop in half the visual distance. So what do we, what do, we do about that? Uh, the railroads then came up with absolute permissive blocks. So they, they, they put a little more logic in, into how the signals work. And again, APB, it's electronic checking to prevent, prevent trains from running into each other. And the official wording is it's citing to citing protection for opposing moves and signal to signal protection for following moves. And basically all the rest of the stuff is the same. So how does it work? Okay, we got a train again going from westbound. He's approaching his first signal. Signals are exactly the same. We've got an absolute uh, protecting getting out onto the single track. As soon as the locomotive passes, this, this head signal, the first signal, then it turns to red. In addition, all the opposing signals drop down to red as well. This is often called tumble down. So consequently, if, if, if this train came through first and we had one coming from the other direction, he would see that, that this signal is red. He would see it's an absolute signal and he would stop. He wouldn't enter the signal single track. As the train progresses, then the signals drop down, down behind him. And again, we've got the uh, three aspect red, yellow, green behind him. In addition, the signals in the opposing direction clear up from, from red to green. So something like that. Details, no sighting detection typically on APV. Permissive signals, except for the ones at the uh, uh, getting onto the single track. Um, signal show condition of the track. Here is the logic the, for, for doing uh, um, these signals. And it goes something like this. The first condition is if the block is occupied, which is similar to what we saw with ABS, but they add in or the neighbor direction of travel is enter, then the signal is red. So DOT stands for direction of travel. And that is determined by you, sometimes what's called a, a traffic stick. And that's based upon a, a stick relay is where the, the terminology comes from. Else, if the next signal is red, again, that's like we saw earlier, and the next direction of travel is enter, then the signal is yellow. And so that would be the case for number two over here. Um, and this number, the first condition would be these two signals reflecting it. Else, if the next signal is red and the next direction of travel is not enter, then we get a red. 
and that's the the thing that gives us the tumble down, which would be the signal that's taking that condition. Else, it's green. So, how do you determine direction of travel? This traffic stick thing. If the um, when a signal becomes when a block becomes occupied, the signal says, "Okay, it looks at its neighbor like this." It says if the neighbor direction of travel is exit, then my direction of travel is enter. In, in other words, um, I'm not expecting a train to come from the other block. Therefore, um, my, the train that's tripping my detector is going into the next block. Otherwise, the direction of travel is exit. And when the signal become the block becomes unoccupied, then direction of travel is there's no direction. You can get uh, implementations if you're into discrete logic from uh, the January 1992 Model Railroad article. Uh, Dr. Chubb's chapter 20 of his book uh, talks about how it shows you how to do it in basic and, and JMRI will support you on this. Let's move from there to interlocking signals. Okay, now I'll talk about interlocking plants. A, an interlocking plant, the idea of the signals, of the plant is a crossing or a junction. And an interlocking signal then protects the crossings or the junctions. You'll find that the more routes you put in a crossing or junction, it multiplies the complexity of what's going on in, in, in the signaling. And again, it's appropriate for shout and go, mother may I, and, and all this other good stuff. Um, we, I'm going to look at interlocking plants first because CTC can be as simple as a remote controlled interlocking plant connected um, by dark territory or safety overlay. And I put an asterisk on that because it's actually a little more complicated than that, but not much. Here's a plant. And what signal engineers will talk about is it's called interlocking because when one signal is cleared, it, it locks out the other signals. Um, and there are names for the reasons why the other signals may get locked out. One would be opposing signal lock. This would be a case where a signal cannot clear if an opposing signal is, is already cleared. For example, I've got a cleared signal here. Therefore, this one's going to be forced to red because of one, it's going to stay at red until the, the situation clears up. You may have a conflicting signal lock. A signal cannot clear if, if a conflicting signal is cleared. So here we've got a, a, a signal going from west to east. That then locks out the two uh, crossing signals because we have a conflict. We may have indication or route locking. If the switch is um, a cleared signal, will lock a switch. So after this signal is cleared, you can't move the points on here. You may have a switch indication locking. That would be the if uh, this uh, route was set to go straight through, then this signal cannot clear because it's a fouling switch. Finally, you may have detection locking. In other words, a switch is locked if the track circuit is occupied. So let's go from that to let's, let's look at an example where you might place signals in an interlocking plant. And I put this up here just as a reference. First thing you might do is go through and just list all the various routes through this plant. Um, for example, um, A2T to A8T would be this route. You know, you can list them all. And where we're going to place signals? Well, let's start from backwards. Let's start with, um, we have to implement the locks. That says, because of conflicting signal locks, we're going to want to put um, um, signals on all the frogs. And I should have put some in here, but the diagram is just getting too messy on, on this crossover. So we need to put signals there. We're going to be very naive in how we do this. We need to put signals at points because you want to protect against opposing traffic. And if we go on the basis of this up above where signals are paired, then we want to pair up all the signals. And also based upon um, the, the, the uh, uh, last week's uh, uh, talk, then you probably want to put signals on all your, de your uh, uh, detection boundary, block boundaries and stuff like that. That looks like a really bad case in measles. And um, it looks like overkill. In, in fact, it is. The reason it's overkill is let's go back to the whole reason for putting signals on the layout. It's for safety, okay? So let's say that this signal is red and this one is yellow 
can a train stop between here and here? And the answer is probably not. Therefore, let's get rid of that signal. And its locks then will be propagated out to this signal. For the same reason, let's get rid of that signal. Let's get rid of that signal. Let's get rid of that signal because they're too close together. Let's get rid of that signal. And we can get rid of those. We've now knocked it down to much more manageable. And let's now get rid of the two block boundaries here because that block's not doing anything for us. So we'll get rid of those. But we need a block boundary between them because we want traffic to be able to go across here or here. In other words, we want some parallel activity go going on. So we'll put a block boundary there. And we put in the one that didn't have room. We come up with something like this, much simpler. Now, let me give you a really easy algorithm for deciding where to put your, your signals. Just draw a block, a box around the, um, the, the uh, um, what you got here, the interlocking plant, just draw a box around it. And where that box crosses the tracks, that's where you'll put signals to protect entry into the, uh, um, the interlocking plant. On the prototype, a signal engineer would do an analysis of this. And again, this came from an introduction to North American Railway Signaling, page 124. And what he'd do is he'd analyze all the routes and he would look at which signals are affected, you know, where, where you go from where to where, which switches are affected, what the aspects of the signal should be for each route and what circuit should be locked. I only know of one real signal engineer who's a model railroader. And I, you know, I don't know if I could generate one of these things myself from scratch or how to fill it out and frankly be pretty boring. So that's where I think that the, the, the rule of thumb is just draw a box around it works pretty good. Let's look at a slightly different interlocking plant. Here I've got a, um, basically it's a ladder and I can enumerate all the routes. I've got eight of them. And if I draw a box around it, you can see where the signals would be. And I moved them in a little bit because um, you can slide you can slide your block boundary and your signals along the track to wherever it makes sense. Let's look at what happens if I add one more track like this. I've added a, another uh, um, entry track. I've gone from eight routes to 12 routes. So the complexity has gone up by, by 50%. And I had to put a, a block boundary in here so that I could have a train movement out here at the same time I had a train movement in here. So place the signals on the perimeter and then add interior track circuits for parallel routes. Okay, here we get to um, some of the uh, contention in signaling community. This is kind of like, um, you know, who's hotter, Marianne or Ginger? And I guess I'm kind of showing my, my age here. We can say, well, which is better, you know, um, mustard-based barbecue or tomato-based barbecue? And it, sense, it tends to be kind of a little bit of a, a religious type of thing going on here, unless you're, uh, uh, unless you're modeling a particular prototype. So let's talk about speed signals first. Speed signals do two things. They present the engineer the speed for passing the immediate signal. In other words, he's looking at a signal, and it tells him how fast he needs to go by it. In addition, it provides some look ahead. It gives him a little bit of forewarning about what speed he'll need to be when he approaches the next signal. So there, um, he can adjust his speed accordingly. He has time to plan. And they do this through multiple heads on the signal mass, multiple colors, flashing, things like that. It's conceptually, you know, two speeds is, is conceptually very simple. It's very difficult to explain the aspects. How do you get from, from uh, um, for example, a normal to slow to the particular aspect that it shows? The names of the indications uh, vary between railroads, but again, uh, it's, the, it's something like normal to slow. Or you may hear first speed to approach second speed, limited approach medium, something like that. But the, the, the beauty is that the engineer can set the speed based on the signal and you may mix them up with block signaling. Route signals, on the other hand, they present the route through an interlocking plant. They tell the engineer which path he's gonna take. 
And if you think about the top head is, is basically like a block signal for the through route, red, yellow, green. Um, the bottom head is, is like a block signal for the diverging route. Again, red, yellow, green, maybe some, you know, some flashing colors. The important thing is no speed is shown. Therefore, the engineer must be familiar with the plant. You know, he's got his employee timetable. He's got to dig it out and, and look at it. That tells him what speed uh, to go through the, the, the plant and, and um, take the diverging route, for example. But yet, when you start digging around into these things, the, you'll see there's a lot of commonality. Um, for example, the definition of a diverging clear may be something like proceed on diverging route, not exceeding prescribed speed through turnout. Suddenly we see that speed is being introduced into the, the indication. And this is where the, it was this little bit that got me started thinking about how I wanted to implement signals in cats. Say, so, you know, maybe they're not as dissimilar as they look like. So let's look at this. Here's a chart. And what the chart shows you is that the, the, it's designed for speed signaling. So the first signal, the signal you're looking at are the various rows. The second signal that you would be looking at are the columns. You'll notice that if that down here, stop, our, our stop signals don't have any columns um, influence on them. Because if you're stop, you, you're, it's a hard stop. You, it doesn't, you know, you're not going past the signal. If you don't have a second signal, then you should begin a restricting. And this is where CATS fails in, in how it does its signaling, is that I think I didn't know what was going on here. And I threw up an approach, a yellow rabbit, and a restricting. And I'm trying to figure out how to put this in and not blow everybody out of the water and have them redo their, their layouts. But anyway, so you got a restricting signal if there is no next signal. And this is where um, route-based signaling actually works a little bit better than speed signaling because you could have a red over, okay, the, the nomenclature here is this is what the mask looks like, green over red, red over flashing green over red, and so forth. So you could have a red over flashing red for restricting on, on route-based signaling, and it would be a flashing, you could do a flashing red over red also as well. You can't do that with, with speed signals. So I got ahead of myself. But here's the speed signal on the left. Here's the route signal on the right, the, the aspects for comparable indications. If I were, and um, where I got these from is this is the um, Canadian Railroad, I think it's operating rules, is uh, um, has a, a very complete set of, of um, speed signaling rules. And I use Cora for um, the uh, route signaling. Okay, so if you, if we, since we want to look at how route signals work, if they don't have any speed asks back to them, we can eliminate the medium and the limited uh, routes for the, the immediate signal. And I'd actually like to eliminate the medium, but for some reason the BN has these two signals called, um, uh, I think it's something like approach medium and um, Diverging approach medium. I'm not quite sure where to use them. You have to basically dig into some of the signals engineering. But anyway, if we eliminate the, the, the speed aspects, you'll see that the, the structure, the number of indications and where they reside are basically very much the similar. And in fact, if you look, a lot of the aspects are similar as well. And some of them are, are they're just slight variations like a flashing red instead of a red. So if you understand this, you will understand then how CATS does its, even though it's speed signaling based, how you can do route signals in CATS. Okay, let's move on then. And um, from there, let's go on to centralized traffic control. The railroads found out that that manned stations were expensive, particularly when you keep, try to keep them open 24 hours a day. And if you eliminate the manned stations until they had radios, it was hard to, you know, control the trains in the field. So they, they invented CTC or um, centralized traffic control. I think that was a GRS terminology. And I think USNS then called it a traffic control system. But if you've ever dispatched a, a model railroad using CTC, you'll find that one of the things it does is it lets you do fine control. Some people would say actually micromanage the traffic flow. 
It has control points, also sometimes called security elements, OS sections, and basically they're like really simple interlocking plants. And you can take your control points and you hook them together uh, with uh, ABS or APB signals. And um, in the case of, of uh, uh, CTC now, it's not, it's an extension of safety overlay because the dispatcher directly controls the signals in the control points. Um, that's the equivalent to giving the, the train crew the piece of paper saying you're allowed to proceed. So consequently, you, you can say that CTC, it's uh, proceed on signal indication. And we went over this last week. This is basically the type of equipment you would see in a control point. Here's the architecture. You got a machine of some kind. I'm showing here a knobs and switches machine. It could be a computer screen for it's more modern. And um, the, uh, uh, the machine itself, I'm, so I'm gonna use both um, uh, knobs and switches and, and uh, uh, a CRT or, or flat screen display as, as a CTC machine, the logic behind it, the computer. And it has a telecom port, which gets it out of the office. The telecom port then goes into fiber optics or copper or um, radio or something like that, which is the code line goes out to the vital logic. The vital logic is the direct control over the triad of signals on the control point. You know, the code line goes from one vital logic to the next and to the next, so they're daisy chained. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, code line, what the, the messages on the code line, they look something like this. And someday if we want, we could have a discussion about uh, how CTC the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts of how CTC works and how to figure it out. Um, and, but let me, I'll digress and say that um, one of the protocols between the machine and the vital logic is advanced train control system. So if you're familiar with ATCS MON, you can actually see the messages that go back and forth between the machine and the vital logic. But typically the, the messages have a destination. It'd be like office for this guy or vital logic too. So that's who the message is destined for. It has the source, again, um, office or, or vital logic one who's sending the message. See, typically there's a sequence number. There's typically, again, only two kinds of labels. A request is from the machine to tell the vital logic to do something like um, normalize the points, clear the, clear the westbound signal. The indications are responses from the, um, from the field equipment back to the machine. And there would be things like um, the, the signal has been cleared or I've got occupancy. Um, the thing to note though, is that here we've got the APB or ABS circuits that we talked about earlier. And they're not directly controlled by the, the vital logic. Instead, they're controlled indirectly. So when the dispatcher sets this vital logic to do something indirectly, it'll set the, um, um, the signals out here, but, but not directly at whatsoever. That's why they're called automatic signals. And by the same token, it's bi-directional. Okay, how does it work? Here we've got CTC um, control point on the, the east and the west end. Um, the signal is showing a red. Um, notice that the, uh, the, where we used to have a signal that protected both paths, both the siding and the main on entry to the single track. We now have two signals out here. The dispatcher has control over the turnout. Uh, in the second diagram, the uh, dispatcher uh, clears the signal and uh, train pulls up. He sees a green signal and he just continues on. As the uh, train proceeds, the signal is dropped down behind him. And now the uh, um, the ABS or the APP, APB uh, behavior of the signals would, would occur here. And uh, like I mentioned, there is one minor flaw in this. And the minor flaw is that the control points are not independent because at this place, at this instance in time, we've got a green signal for a westbound move. Unless the control points have communication between them, then the dispatcher could conceivably set this to be green as well. Um, and there's nothing out in here to tell the signaling system that, uh, that, that, the, uh, uh, that there's a westbound move in, in, in existence. So 
the, the uh, two control points need to communicate in the CTC system um, checks for that kind of safety. Okay, here's another alternative. Again, we've got an idle situation. The dispatcher knocks down the uh, signal for a, a westbound move. And when he does that conceivably then, um, the uh, uh, signaling system then could kick in the, uh, the, the tumble down to, to lock out the opposing move. That, that's an alternative way of doing things. What I've seen in the model railroad world is often what people will do is uh, they'll make these signals uh, by default to be red. So consequently, um, what would happen is the dispatcher would, would uh, again, align a route. The, the, the signals on the control points would be held at stop. The dispatcher would line a route and then the intermediate signals, the, the hold on them to red would be removed. So the, again, the train comes along and as he proceeds uh, from right to left, then these signals drop down behind him and they, they return to, to red and they stay at red. Now, again, I'll put this up. When you have ABS and APB are, are, are simple because the signals are paired if you start studying this. Um, paired means that wherever you have a, a eastbound signal, you have a westbound signal. And if, we, if you remember how we determined direction of travel, each signal looked at its neighbor. Um, in addition, what that means is that the, the opposing signals here and here, they, they basically protect the same pieces of track. Let's look at another example down here. I've got a, a CTC machine. I've got a control point right here. We're running CTC. I want to do a left-hand move. So I set the lever for a left-hand move and I code the button. Will the machine let me make this, turn this into a, a, a green? And the answer is yes. Now I'm going to change it, the scenario, just ever so slightly. I'm going to make this signal red. So is this a safe move? And the answer is no. And the reason is because this signal is the tumble down for an eastbound move. And so you should not allow it because if we look at the tracks that are protected by the various signals here, because they're not paired, a westbound move, this signal protects all the track from here to here. And this signal protects the tracks from here to here, and then from here to here. So consequently, the their air zones of protection are not the same. And um, if you try to implement uh, something like this, it gets to be, uh, you, you very quickly twist your head in the very strange places. And the rule I came up from doing this is that imposing signal lock, which is what we're trying to do here, it propagates the first opposing signal at or after the next signal in advance. So that's the, the, the rule that I've tried to implement. I'm just trying to demonstrate the complexity of this. It gets more complicated because now um, we've added uh, speeds, like you know, track speed of 49 and 25. So consequently, the railroads went to multiple heads. Often those are actually called arms. Um, and um, you have to then account for green, yellow, red and stuff. So you would then add to your aspect map then uh, if you're doing route signaling, then two more aspects for uh, the vision clear and diverging approach. We talked about this last week, turnouts. And all I'm going to say here is that if you've got a turnout out on the main line somewhere, um, that uh, uh, you need to knock th that when the uh, crew unlocks the signals, you unlocks the signals, unlocks the turnout. I'm sorry, you want to probably drop the signals down to red. So what, what goes into determining what a CTC signal, what indication should have? And we've talked about occupancy and advanced signals and all the various locks and other things and the dispatcher of the tarman action. So there's a lot of more stuff going on here in determining what is, an, uh, what is the indication. And as you can see, that's reflected here. In, in comparison to uh, ABS and APB, Optionally, now the sightings are detected. Um, you got a triad instead of just dual signals here. Um, and, and the whole triad is absolute. 
You could have, again, the, uh, the permissive signals on the intermediates in between. Um, uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, basically, you could, you could uh, tumble down, could kick in. And for a computer is essential for doing the dispatcher interface. And if you think about what does the centrum centralized traffic control means, it means you know, it all comes back to a central point. So you, you basically have to do things with a, a computer. The implementations, Dr. Chubb's chapters 21 through 25 show you how to do this using a basic programming language. Again, Jim or I will help you with this. And as we all know why we're here, it's because cats will do it. And with that, here are my references. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Jerry. Hey, thank you, Rodney. Does everybody have a headache now? <laughs> Actually, I did find this helpful because, uh, you know, one of the challenges for me, model the 1950s and, uh, you know, I'd love to have a computerized US and S panel. Uh, and I did start one in, in JMRI Panel Pro. Uh, but modeling the Pensy, I've got a four-track interlocking with six crossovers and then a, a fifth pathway into a yard, and, and working through that logic is pretty difficult. Uh, CATS makes it a lot easier, which is why I'm, I'm using CATS at least for an interim panel. And, uh, you know, when I get the USNS done, I may just leave it for the, the, the operator to decide if they want a modern panel or a 50s panel and let, let them go from there. Because uh, Rodney really made it easy compared to some of the JMRI stuff, even though that's come a long way. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when we start getting into these multi-track, there's a lot of logic. So with that, I'll I'll open it up for anybody who has questions. I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. So if you set the system up at SCTC. So the dispatcher can dispatch it. If you want it to run automatically at the open house, isn't it just a, just the simple move of the dispatcher setting all the routes prior to the start of an open house? Not a, not really, because um, with CTC, um, when a train goes through, it, it clears up the signal, knocks down the signals behind it, it cancels out the route. So the dispatcher then needs to reset the route after the, the train goes through each time. Um, what I did in CATS, I see Dalen's on, Dalen's done something a little different, is in CATS, I made it really easy to change between ABS and APB and CTC. Basically, you just use a text editor and you go into your layout file and you change all of uh, where it says uh, CTC to ABS, for example, and then you'd have two you'd have two files, two layouts files. One would be for an open house, and one would be for an operating session. Okay, all right. And you can good. you can't go back and forth in real time, but you, you know you can. Right, you can start up that way. Yes. Okay. If you do happen to have a a multi-track layout, when you've got two tracks the whole way through, you can also use the fleeting capability. The what? Fleet? Is that the term you use in, in yep. CATS? Okay. Yeah, so call it fleeting. Yeah, term works I have never heard of. Yeah, you can, you can right-click on a signal in CATS, and, and that'll be in one of the videos, where instead of just setting a, a route uh, in one direction, it'll remember that route. So it'll, it'll temporarily treat it as um, ABS, so it'll knock down when a train passes it, but it's going to reset to the same route as soon as it becomes clear. Okay. So that yeah. way the people in the open house get to do the ooh-ah when they see your signals changing. Uh, but really, there's no work for a dispatcher. Okay. But the one trick there for fleeting to work is, it, is your layout has to be basically a, a loop all yes. running in one direction on any given track. Yeah. Yeah, which is fine for display running. I mean, the public generally doesn't get it, you know. Um, right. Yeah, and if I, wanted, I wanted to be both ways. I wanted to be able to run it for an open house, but I also would like to have it as an operational piece too. Yeah, so just, uh, you know, right click and remove the fleeting when you're done. Okay. Actually, I got you don't have to that. do anything special to implement it. 
Yeah, actually, the next time you load the file, you know, if you're shut down in between, it'll uh, default back to the original anyway, the fleeting okay. off. Yeah, so I've, I've got a Pensy four-track main, and I've got a, a branch line um, that I have a hidden connector so the branch line can loop also. So I've had open houses where I'm running five trains at a time uh, without a crew. They're brave. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it takes a real man to be an SPF, right, Jerry? <laughs> it's a lot to maintain. Well, I can I can see right now that it took Rodney a little bit of time to do all this, so we can just click on it with a mouse and everything works just fine. All the other stuff Rodney did for us. Uh, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, when you when you just click on that turnout point and it throws the switch, and then you click on a signal to set it, it and that and then it shows you the route. It's like wow, <laughs> and it locks it. Mm -hmm. The fact that all that locking is in place that that's phenomenal. So, you, yeah. you could have somebody who's generally familiar with dispatching, running on cats, and you know really running well in, you know. 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, uh, that's the thing I really love about it. You know, it's, it's not exactly right for my railroad, but uh, you know, correct. Uh, they, they used CAD, but CAD is horrible. Um, uh, it's just, just the most complicated system. And, you know, I have the same mentor I met that Rodney did. So yes. <laughs> you, know, you just wouldn't want to do it. And uh uh, you know, whereas cats is, you know, it, it's point and click. If if people understand about the theory of setting up meets and checking for siding length, you know, they're in business, and uh, you know they can have a wonderful time, uh, and, and and everybody else on the railroad can, and and with with almost no learning curve. Right. If they could just conceptualize the distances between control points anybody could sit down and run a railroad for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're not fighting with the system. I mean, you know, your point about, you know, the four track mainline to, to get those kinds of interlockings to work in the strict columnar system that, you know, a GRS or, or, or US and S, uh, you know, toggle machine would require, you know, it, you really have to think about it. And, you know, you're constantly looking at the model board going, now, let's see, what is this calm control? And, you know, by the time you get a big complicated interlocking like you're describing going, you know, the column's over here and and the model board point is over there. And, you know, I'm sure if you came in and did it eight hours a day, five days a week, you know, it wouldn't be a problem. You just know it. But, you know, to get somebody running 20 minutes into the session so that, they're not slowing everything down, you know, that'd be very, very difficult, even for, you know, somebody who is a professional dispatcher. Yeah, I have a friend that's uh, about an hour from here who's modeling the Reading, and he's moving right along getting his USNS panel up and running, but he's got a one-track main line with, with passing sidings. So all of his control points have one turnout, and, you know, there's, there's one switch, there's one signal lever, and then there's a, uh, a code button. I'm like, that's great, but when you, you know. Yeah, exactly. Tracks, I mean, one, one column, one control point is I'm, pretty yeah, great. I might have three different turnouts to one signal, and right. that, that's a lot to loop together. Yeah. Anything else? I, I was going to say, un unrelated to this, I've got one control point that uh, it's, it's implemented with LCC, and it was a bit of a challenge of getting that logic working because it was nominally a double crossover, except, well, one leg of the double crossover was actually going into the yard, which is dark. The ma mating leg of that, well, that was coming from the passenger station. And then in between on the other main is the route to the industrial area on the far side of the tracks. So you had basically three entries on one side and two entries on the other side. 
and it uh, took a bit to get all of the what has to preclude what has to preclude what. Yeah. And all the extra safety stuff around passenger on most railroads. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, you going off into dark territory, I mean, generally, okay, make sure they're no faster than restricting and knock yourself out. And that's great. But you, you don't do that in a passenger terminal. Most railroads didn't allow that. Um, you know, some of them like B&O had just different aspects uh, for going into passenger terminals, which, you know, you weren't allowed to have two trains in the same block and there were no stop and, and, and proceeds uh, because you, you know, the safety issues. So, um, you know, it gets very complicated very quickly. And what we'll do is, is, is Ken, sometime and we'll have an advanced class here and I'll show you how to set um, up uh, cats uh, using um, uh, speeds on tracks to get, get good signaling for that kind of situation where you've got a, a plant that has like two entries and three exits. To it. I'll have to watch for that one as well. So, so we've had to ha just had two conceptual sessions with Rodney. Next week, he's going to wrap them together and, and show how, how we work with cats. Then we're going to give Rodney a little bit of a break, um, although he is going to come back in December and do one on um, – there will be a new release of JMRI coming out and a companion new release of CATS, and he's going to preview that for us, show us some new functionality. Um, and then we got some advanced stuff that he'll, he'll start doing over the course of the winter. Uh, we'll get all those little uh, snippets posted as well with some samples. And as we start doing that, um, if we get into some more, some of you guys that, that have some uh, uh, scenarios already developed, you know, the more complex puzzles or whatever, if you want to share that, I can set up a private video uh, meeting between us and then you can do a, a demo of it and we can post it for everybody. Good to go for tonight. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.